These mountains were home to an economic boom turned into a tale of ecological disaster, largely precipitated by mining operations long vanished. Even before World War II, mining here delivered wealth to companies and food to families' tables. Unfortunately, the cost of that boom era was the degradation of a once pristine watershed. Runoff from mines rich in pyrite flowed with sulfuric acid, and in the long run, acid mine drainage brought death to aquatic life and significant losses to local economies. But where other stories might end, this one begins with the Cheat River Valley as host to an unfolding success story. Our efforts today are the culmination of a project that started six or seven years ago uh, with the idea that we could get a bunch of government agencies and state agencies and private groups together to clean up uh, the acid mine drainage that was reducing fish populations and impacting water quality throughout the Cheat Basin. It's really upsetting to see how much impact acid mine drainage has in this watershed. And I want to do as much as I can while I'm working for Friends of the Cheat to make a difference and try to remediate some of the problems and educate the public on what impact AMD has on the watershed. We're all involved in uh, promoting the cleanup of acid mine drainage, which is such a problem in this part of the country, uh, especially in West Virginia, Pennsylvania. And, uh, some parts of Ohio. I think we're missing out on an awful lot of an e economic base. As we heal this watershed, we can provide a new stream of economic impacts, positive economic impacts for the area. Fishing, tourism, and other things that heretofore have been impossible because of poor water quality. There's been some studies done that showed that a mile of trout stream is worth over $40,000 to the economy. The work of these organizations thus far has been remarkable, including reclamation projects on Greens Run and Sovereign Run. But perhaps most encouraging are the results of the projects at McCarty High Wall and Big Bear Lake, which allowed the reintroduction of native brook trout into Beaver Creek, a stream previously rendered lifeless due to AMD. Here we're uh, using the backpack electrofishing gear to capture these fish. This is a method of uh, fish sampling that doesn't injure the fish. It shocks them, stuns them momentarily, and allows us to dip those fish up. We're collecting native brook trout that are native and endemic to the Cheat River watershed, and uh, we're moving them from one stream to another. Friends of the Cheat and uh, volunteers from Trout Unlimited uh, and just some interested uh, fishermen friends of ours are assisting us in this effort today. I'm here just as a volunteer. My neighbor works for the DNR and I'm interested in fish. I'm a fly fisherman, a conservationist, catch and release. And I'm interested in all kinds of fishing but I especially like the brook trout streams. We've captured approximately 55 uh, larger or the adult brook trout. This has been the first time that we've been able to uh, transplant fish into a stream that uh, formerly uh, uh, supported this species but had been wiped out because of mine drainage years and years ago. We continue uh, the efforts that has already been underway now for about five years on the clean streams that we will see the day within several uh, decades when we will clean up the last of the streams affected by past mining. Uh, but there are literally uh, thousands of miles to go. The success achieved on Beaver Creek is attributable to the partnerships forged through the River of Promise. That partnership includes government involvement to help fund and provide technical support. The first steps have been taken with Promise, but AMD is still present and demands our attention. Programs that helped fund the McCarty AMD project, like OSM's Watershed Cooperative Agreement Grant Program, are crucial for the work that is still needed to bring life back to the river. The Friends of the Cheat know they have a long road ahead of them, and they could use your help. To learn more about the Friends of the Cheat, or what you could do to make a difference in your watershed, log on to www.cheat.org, or write us at 119 South Price Street, Kingwood, West Virginia, 26537.
It's no secret that America's most industrious cities have developed along the banks of its great waterways. These slow-moving but powerful arteries have carried the goods, services, and culture that fueled a growing nation. We all know that progress comes with a cost, but only now are we starting to realize the price of the legacy that our ancestors left behind. At the dawn of the last century, our growing nation was starving for resources and there was little consideration for the future of the environment. And now, generations later, we are left to deal with their lack of insight. One part of that story starts along the banks of a river in West Virginia just outside of Morgantown. Nobody really knows how the river got its name, but as far back as anyone can remember, before the United States was a nation, it has been called the Cheat River. Ralph McCarty shares his version of this local folklore. There was a French Huguenot named Jacques that trapped up this way from North Carolina. These cartographers who came through, the map makers in the early days, if you lived on a particular run, they would ask you your name and that turned out to be the name of the run. This happened to be Jacques Chateau in spelling it out on his map. It got abridged and emasculated down to cheat. The early European settlers gained access to the area by traveling the Indian trails that followed the great rivers and streams of the watershed. It was easier to follow the river valleys than to blaze new trails over the mountains. Early explorers had already navigated most of the eastern waterways, but the rivers of the central Appalachians refused for many years to cooperate. The New, the Gauley, the Tigard, and the Cheat were untamable as river highways and often described by the local Native American tribes as rivers of death. Now the Cheat is not considered a navigable river from its uh, source in Randolph County to its mouth in Point Marion, Pennsylvania. It falls over 3,000 feet. In spite of wild rivers and harsh terrain, some of the first settlers made their homes throughout the watershed. As time passed, more people came into this valley, settled along the creek. As early pioneers, they found abundant game, clean water, fish, and large tracts of timber. This thick blanket of forest would spawn the first major industry in the area, logging. Much of the wood was used in the manufacture of charcoal for iron making and then some of it was uh, rafted down the Cheat River. Every log cut out of those counties was floated down the Cheat through what's now the famous White Wildwood Country, through what's now Cheat Lake, and down to Point Marion where there were big sawmills that caught these logs in big booms. The first environmental effects of this great demand for lumber would be felt far from the watershed itself. Excessive stripping of timber in West Virginia's highlands caused severe flooding of the city of Pittsburgh over a hundred miles away. For the first time in the watershed, it was apparent that the environmental impacts of any industry had to be taken seriously. So the chief actually, when they started Eastern National Forest, was the first stream to start to be protected. The preservation of the Monongahela National Forest was a monumental step for conservationists. But the timber industry wasn't the only threat that the environment had to face. Starting about 1796, they discovered that there was iron in the Cheap Mountain Range. Iron was a very scarce product. Most of the people coming in, the only iron they had was an axe, a rifle, and a pocket full of nails. Relics of the 18th century iron furnaces are still visible along the banks of the Cheat River and its tributaries. By the uh, 1830s, there were uh, four or five iron furnaces right there in that uh, Cheat Mountain area. And this was a period where, when iron making and logging were the prominent industries. The demand for these resources fueled by the onslaught of the Civil War that sparked the great railroad building era and Appalachia's rivers provided a pre-cut pass through the mountains. Uh, this period started with the construction of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad which passed through the watershed in 1852. 
the uh, Baltimore and Ohio was quite an engineering uh, feat. Uh, in fact, uh, two of the, the, the most famous engineering monuments of the B&O uh, still stand in Preston County. Uh, the Trays Run Viaduct, which is a, uh, essentially a bridge over a large valley, and then nearby is the uh, Kingwood Tunnel, which uh, when it was built in 1852 uh, was the largest in the world. Speculators now had a way to get massive amounts of coal and timber out of the mountains. The boom was on. For the first time, coal consumption in the U.S. surpassed wood consumption, and by the late 1880s, large-scale mining and logging were welcomed as the economic salvation of this difficult, sparsely settled land. Once again, ignoring environmental consequences as the frenzy raged on. Along with timber came the, the great uh, coal rush of the 1890 to 1920 period. Uh, hundreds of mines were started, not just in the cheat watershed, but all over West Virginia. The nation's furnaces and its locomotives were fueled with this coal. Later, Appalachian coal fueled America's industrial revolution. In 1900, West Virginia mines produced 21 million tons of coal and employed 28,000 people. By World War I, the mountains had been penetrated by railroads, and the region's vast coal reserves could be reached and marketed at last. The coal mining industry came into that area. There were some mines that developed during the First World War, but the big onslaught was strip mining that came in during the Second World War. The big energy source during World War II was coal. Production rose steadily and peaked in 1947 when 173 million tons were mined and approximately 120,000 people were employed. Rivers delivered the coal and coke that smelted the iron into steel. The rivers were the lifeblood of the emerging nation. America's streams were her roads, yet they were also her sewers. Every time the earth was pierced, layers of rock, high in pyrite, began to oxidize, forming what we now call acid mine drainage. Dr. Paul Zimkevich of the National Research Center for Coal and Energy. Acid mine drainage is the kind of acid water that you get out of a mining environment where the rocks or the coal contain pyrite, and the pyrite then comes in contact with air and water. The overall chemical reaction gives you sulfuric acid, and dissolved metals like iron, manganese, and aluminum. Either unaware of or indifferent to any potential environmental disaster, the mining continued virtually unregulated. A lot of this resulted in runoff, acid runoff, because the coal had an overburden of iron pyrite. And this started to degrade the river and reduce the fishing population. Studies have shown that the uh, fish populations are reduced up to 90 percent throughout much of the river because of the acid mine drainage. I've heard tales of people having uh, walleye pike and bass in Cheap River uh, and this goes way back in the 20s and 30s but I understand it was just a wonderful fishery. The upper part of the river, the northern part, is the whitewater stretch. It's also some of the better fish habitat. Uh, unfortunately, it's also the stretch where uh, most of the acid mine drainage impacts the river. There's been some studies done by the cold water fisheries, and it was based on some information, I think, from the Fish and Wildlife Service, that showed that a mile of trout stream is worth over $40,000 to the economy. The economic benefits are much greater than people think. If you have fish in the river, you've got a good river. Fishing wasn't the only industry to suffer from the effects of acid mine drainage. During the late 60s and early 70s, whitewater kayaking started to become a popular sport. I started hiking along the Chief in 1953, and it was 1970 and 71 before I ever saw a kayak or a raft going through the narrows or going through the, the canyon. Throughout the 70s and early 80s, many people were introduced to the wonders of classic whitewater on the Chief. We were the, the first 
uh, to run the Cheat River as a, um, a commercial enterprise. So we bought a raft from the Pittsburgh AYH that we called the Black Mariah, and uh, it was an old military raft, and it had more patches on it than anything else. And it turns out that more people wanted to go in the raft than wanted to go in the kayak, so um, well, my mama didn't raise no dummies, and that <laughs> it came on pretty fast that maybe there's something to this rafting business. Many of the boaters soon became intolerant of the water that burned their eyes and found themselves squared off against miners and loggers. The public's hasty and oversimplified understanding of the problem characterized the battle as wacky enviros against the evil mining industry. No agency, no organization, no company could begin to solve the problems alone. For years, these abandoned mines continued to leak their poisonous red water, slowly choking the life from the watershed around them. Acid mine drainage in the Cheat is, is causing major impacts. There was a, almost a fatalistic approach uh, for the previous 20 or 30 years when people simply assumed that since there was acid mine drainage in these rivers that it would always be that way. Fishermen went upstream, swimmers went to other rivers, and the boating industry felt a huge decline. This is a powerful river that wants to be alive. It's got a great heritage of uh, being untouched and unhurt, but finally it, it gets hurt down here. Well, I can remember definitely the fish had died. Oh, they'd be fish that, that long, that long here. You know, fish have rights too. This is. I think this has created a lot of homeless fish. Many in the watershed felt that something had to be done. Concerned citizen groups tried to raise awareness. You kind of get sensitive as to preserving it. You know, when people get in there and step on it a little bit, then you start, you start shouting about it and you start trying to do something about it. I wrote some letters and uh, to the state trying to uh, see if anything could be done about cleaning up the pollution. Uh, and some state agencies had looked at it, but it was a big problem, uh, huge amounts of money estimated to, to do uh, any kind of reclamation work, so, so very little was done. After years of public outcry, the voices finally began to reach Washington. When uh, Bob Urim became the director of, of OSM, uh, one of his real interests was to do something positive uh, with acid mine drainage. I pledged during my confirmation process to be an advocate for increased funding specifically for the Appalachian Clean Streams Initiative. That's the start and uh, hopefully the Congress will approve that and hopefully in each uh, successive budget year uh, the President and the Congress will continue to appropriate more and more funds from the abandoned mine land fund so we can clean up abandoned mine lands uh, here in Appalachia and elsewhere in the country. Working with uh, people like Bob Burham and other folks in the states, uh, in OSM, uh, we were able to put together the Clean Streams Initiative. Um, the Appalachian Clean Streams Initiative is, is really a cooperative effort to get uh, government and private industry, citizens, universities, uh, everybody who's interested in uh, cleaning up acid mine drainage involved in that, pooling our talents and resources to this huge problem. Meanwhile, back in the watershed, a volatile situation was erupting. Along the banks of Muddy Creek, a major tributary of the Cheat, the owner of the TNT mine attempted to divert excess water from his mine through a neighboring abandoned mine. This illegal attempt backfired and the eruption of acid-laden water poured into Muddy Creek. The water pressure built up so high in the, inside the mine that it blew out uh, plugs that were put in the old portals. All of that water blew out of the mine virtually overnight. Unfortunately, the whole complexion changed in this area when uh, the TNT blowout happened. It's, it's, a, it's a harsh reality to, to you know, go down in the water that's below Muddy Creek. Of course, it wasn't the first time that Muddy Creek was polluted, but this was certainly the worst thing that I'd seen 
in here in this area in 20 years. It was a second blowout of AMD from the same mine that spawned the organization that would forever change the fate of the Cheat watershed. About that same time, uh, Friends of the Cheat uh, our, one of our early meetings got together, I believe it was early summer of 94. These groups of friends, drawn together by the river itself, were moved and motivated by the events unfolding around them. The funny thing about the Friends of the Cheat was, you know, the first thing we did is we all sat down and we wrote a list of maybe a hundred things that we were going to do to fix the world. In no time at all we found out that we weren't worthy. And so what we tried to do is become an effective organization that could go out and express our agenda. Fledgling organizations often fail due to lack of leadership. The Friends of the Cheat were lucky to have Dave Bassage. Well, you know, most of our efforts have been focused on partnerships, coalition building, and trying to show that we really are all in the same boat and getting a lot of people to work together for a common cause. We have a small board that, that works well, and uh, Dave Bassage is the executive director. has been able to work in partnership with a lot of the organizations in the state and federal government. We've looked at the bigger problem of all the acid mine drainage in the watershed and we've put together a really interesting coalition of government agencies, um, conservation groups, and in private industry who are all pooling their resources to address the problem. We call it the River of Promise Shared Commitment. And uh, so far we've been able to bring six million dollars worth of reclamation work right here into the watershed. We've got a lot more on the uh, drawing board and we've put together kind of a master plan that should be able to bring aquatic life back here to the Cheat Canyon as well as the streams that feed it. One of the most successful tools for raising both awareness and funds for the Friends of the Cheat has been the Cheat Festival. This festival is a great time. We've got a lot of people in the whitewater community that come here and a lot of manufacturers with that, but it's also a lot of family-oriented activity, and this year we put a lot of stress on that. And there's just a whole lot of different activities going on, and every year it seems like it gets a little bigger, a little more popular, and uh, it's also a big, big money raiser for us as well. You know, the fact that 1,500 people a year show up to pay their money to say, yeah, let's fix the cheat. That says something. That's a lot of people who say, this is in our interest. This is, this is what we want. Friends of the Cheat are really what uh, basically gotten a, a lot of the progress towards cleaning up the environment here. Uh, they're the ones that have gotten it together. I mean, just like this festival itself, uh, you know, hundreds of, of the Friends of the Cheat members, you know, get together to do this. It's real impressive to me and to other people in Charleston to see this type of activity occurring. It makes it much easier for me to go down and, and lobby for, for funds when you can so, show such a, a local effort. It makes my job a lot easier, really. When we drafted the River of Promise document, the uh, mission statement, I think if you had been in the room with the government agencies, uh, Friends of the Cheat, anchor employees, I don't think you could tell who was who. It was just that much cooperation. You know, that's another thing about the Friends of the Cheat is that we've been successful. We've been able to, in the last couple of years, successfully bring some money in to start treatment. And it'll take a long time to fix it up. This is realistically probably a 20-year project. The Friends of the Cheat immediately realized that cooperation was going to be the key element in any chance of progress. Our first project was on Greens Run, which was a project that was funded by Anchor Energy. A few of us concerned citizens here in the watershed sat down to a breakfast meeting with John Faltus, the president of Anchor Energy. We want to be a team with the West Virginia Rivers Coalition, with Friends of the Cheat, and really turn this ugly situation around and eliminate acid mine drainage on the Cheat River. Sure enough, we found out that they were sincere and not only wanted to make a difference here, but set an example regionally and nationwide of responsible business, responsible industry, giving back to the community and the environment. He asked me to just scout around and see what, what we could find that we thought we could really help. In designing the passive system at Greens Run, we did have a fair amount of area to deal with, and so we built a very large anoxic limestone drain, and uh, it worked very well for the first little while. Monitoring at Green's Run began to show initial design flaws that only inspired the team to further pioneer new techniques. It's opportunities like this where we can watch specific installed systems. That's what allows us to learn something. We completed the Green's Run project in uh, 
late 95. It's had a few problems, but right now we're neutralizing about 57 tons of acid per year that goes into the cheat. The Friends of the Cheat also learned that partnering with business alone would not be enough. Their next project at Sovereign Run pooled from much larger resources. We wanted the DEP's umbrella. In other words, we, we wanted their blessing. We wanted them involved in it. So we went to them. We met Rick Buckley in that same process, and it just seemed to balloon from there. Recently, uh, we, have been at, we were able to obtain $80,000 from EPA uh, in the form of a grant for one specific project and uh, that project is Sovereign Run. Once again, the Friends of the Cheat saw a way to make something positive happen. So the Friends of the Cheat, which has a technical committee, all got together and this team put together a plan which involved raising the level of this pond here with this little dike, backing the water up over the top of the mine pool to cut off the oxygen supply in there. The water that is in this pond is acidic uh, does need to be treated so we run it down 684 feet of open limestone channel. That length is sufficient to treat 100 percent of the acid load that leaves this site. The significance of this project for us is not just the very important improvements it's making in water quality but that, um, that we were able to put our partnership to work and actually get practical results out of this uh, diverse team that we have. Friends of the Cheat uh, represent an important part of the equation because there isn't enough government money to do it all and so we'll need uh, volunteer efforts and nonprofit communities, uh, county and local governments making a contribution where they can. The coal companies themselves made contributions by paying fees based upon the amount of coal that is mined. We pay 15 cents a ton for deep mine coal and 35 cents a ton for surface mine coal since 1977 and we got billions of dollars in DC. Each year about 265 million dollars comes in from the coal industry paying production fees and so what we are hearing from the impacted communities uh, is that we'd like to see more of the revenues that are flowing in each year appropriated out to the state. You really gotta get in there and spend money and go to work. Friends of the Cheat did go to work again in the year 2000 when they began the McCarty High Wall Project. Uh, we're standing here on the McCarty High Wall Project at Leech Bed Number 2. This will be the one furthest downstream. What we're doing here is uh, Jennifer is sampling the, what will be uh, the outfall from Leech Bed Number 2 here. Again, we're getting pre-construction uh, water quality data. This will allow us to set the performance of the, the entire McCarty High Wall Project. The end result here will be the acidic water coming in will be turned circum neutral, the metals will drop out in the open limestone channel, and Beaver Creek will receive good water. The efforts of the Friends of the Cheat have not only impacted water quality, but more importantly have served as a model for other watershed related organizations. I um, have been a board member for, uh, with Friends of the Cheat, and I'm also a board member with the CLEAR organization, the Cheat Lake Environmental Recreation Association. Uh, CLEAR has been around for uh, over 10 years, working very tightly with Allegheny Energy uh, to work on the development of the Cheat Lake Trail, is what you see in the background here. The uh, recreational development and much of the work that's been done on Cheat Lake is a result of the relicensing of the hydropower project that started in 1990. There have been numerous meetings over the last 10 years to have culminated in this development. Most of this is predicated on the fact that the water quality on the lake has improved markedly in the last 10 or 12 years. The Friends of the Cheat has done some excellent work upstream cleaning up some of the acid mine drainage problems and of course we benefit directly from that. The water in Sheet Lake has been improving over the last few years, um, improving significantly enough that the Northern Pike Fisheries has been started from, by DNR. The fish population is, is a result of everything that's going on in the watershed. And we can talk about improvements in water quality and that the pH has gotten better, the acidity has decreased, but people can't see that. But they can see and relate to an improvement in the fish population. They know when they go out here and they catch a largemouth bass that's 12 inches or they catch five walleyes, uh, they know what that means. The key to this whole cleanup is, is the government agencies and all the partnerships we built, working together, bringing money in, doing this planning, 
and then seeing, seeing the work go into the ground where the real cleanup is needed. There are a number of the streams that uh, are being treated right now and much of the cheat itself does not have adequate uh, fish populations to sustain a, a, a recreational fishery. Um, and, and that is one of the objectives that we have, is at least to get it to that level. Possibly the most important accomplishment of the Friends of the Cheat is raising public awareness enough to get more people involved in the entire watershed. But they've done a really uh, exciting reclamation job on the Blackwater River. It's allowed them in the last couple of years to stock trout for the first time in a couple of decades in a stretch of river that never used to be able to support a fishery. And now they're in there catching trout again. And that's exactly what we hope to do down here. One of the things we've been able to do through the Friends of the Chief is put in some of these ideas, document what the situation looked like beforehand, uh, document the costs, and then document the effectiveness of the treatment later on. So it's real encouraging to see that we're, we're, we're just, we feel like we're headed in the right direction. As far as the pollution goes, it's a tough fight and it's not over. The key to it is money. Big money. More funds. Money. Funds. Money. 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 Millions of dollars to actually uh, have a, a major impact on this. So we're restoring a major river system, and this just does not occur. You don't make more cheat rivers, and we are have the, having the opportunity here in our careers and our lifetime to bring back a river that most of the people that have lived here have never been able to experience, and that is absolutely amazing. The Friends of the Cheat know they have a long road ahead of them, and they could use your help. To learn more about the Friends of the Cheat or what you can do to make a difference in your watershed, log on to www.cheat.org or write us at 119 South Price Street, Kingwood, West Virginia, 26537. Who would have thought 20 years ago that we'd be paying more for a gallon of water than we do for a gallon of gas? The River of Promise is the real-life success story of a grassroots group that's doing something about acid mine drainage in Appalachia. We're restoring a major river system, and this just does not occur. You don't make more cheap river. Watch the River of Promise to learn what happened when one group of friends said, enough is enough.